With the fourth pick in the 2020 entry draft, the Detroit Red Wings are very excited to select from Fralunda, Lucas Raymond. They are dreams realized. Hearing your name called by an NHL franchise with a hope shared by each that the player and the team find each other at the game's highest level. And this draft is considered a pivot point for one of the game's storied franchises. The Red Wings hoping to determine their future and find glory yet again. Those players selected are trying to find their way here inside the Red Wings dressing room, and we are delighted to be back. Welcome to our Red Wings post-draft show here on Fox Sports Detroit. I'm John Keating, joined by a select panel of, let's call them experts, the television play-by-play -play voice of the Red Wings. Ken Daniels is alongside. Art Regner of DetroitRedWings.com, the radio play-by-play -play voice of the Wings, Ken Cal, and our own Trevor Thompson as well. As we all know, nothing is normal here in 2020, and the guy who would make the picks for the Red Wings, Steve Eiserman, was in contact with someone who was in contact with someone who had tested positive for COVID, and out of an abundance of caution, Steve decided to stay at home for the draft process. He will join us virtually as well here coming up on the show. We knew that one, two, and three were going to go one, two, and three in some order with two and three for Kenny was going to be very interesting. And it was up to the Red Wings brain trust what they felt they needed most. And I think ultimately that's where they decided on Lucas Raymond, a guy who can score. He's got a great shot. And we've seen the highlights and, and the hat trick against Russia for Sweden and the winner in overtime, spectacular. And here's a guy from what his coaches say in Sweden, just loves the big stage and wants to be the guy. And that's what they want. And they wanted high hockey sense, high hockey skill. They got that in Lucas Raymond. Uh, many drafts had Lucas Raymond, if not four, three, many had him up there too. It just what uh, Steve wanted most at this time. And I think he felt goal scoring and high skill. He'd be a guy. Art, there wasn't much to differentiate, it seemed, the guys who were going four through probably eight in this draft. What's interesting about Raymond was is that I guess two summers ago now, he was at the Summer Showcase in Plymouth as part of Team Sweden, which is a precursor to choosing your national junior team for the World Juniors. And Lucas Raymond, along with Alexi Lafreniere, were considered to be the one-two prospects at that point. Raymond then went to the Swedish Hockey League and played for Frulunda, a very, very well-established program known throughout the world for being just a great, great hockey club. Because he was so young, he didn't play a lot. And his stock sort of fell down. But when you look at it, as far as when he's with his age group, he is a dominant player. And I think Steve said it best that his skill set translates where he does everything well. And I think where the Red Wings are at, he's a puck distributor. Ken's absolutely right. He can shoot the puck. So the more I think about it, the more this makes sense because Steve said this. And Steve Eiderman doesn't say this very often. He has the potential to be an elite forward in this league. And I think that's why they chose him. Kenny, everybody wants defensemen. Did it surprise you that we didn't go for a defenseman? Uh, you know what? It did and it didn't. I really thought that they would go offense. And Lucas Raymond really fits that bill. And what I really like about Lucas Raymond is the fact that he's a cerebral player. Like, he, he has a good hockey IQ. And the thing about uh, Lucas Raymond is that uh, he's on, good on both sides of the puck. So, you know, I think it was a wise pick. And, you know, you got to go with talent. And he's certainly a talented hockey player. And Trev, Super Scout Hawk and Anderson's thumbprint is all over this draft. Well, in the Swedish ties can't be ignored, John. Certainly, they've got a lot of talent. They, they should probably set up a satellite office in Stockholm, right? I mean, that's <laughs> that's how involved they are in who's coming up through the Swedish circles. And you've got Nick Lidstrom, and now you got Henrik Zetterberg over there to a degree. And certainly, they have their, their eyes and their ears open. And you've got to pay attention to them. And you look at Hawk and Anderson's track record. I mean, he's proven his, himself as a talent evaluator, too. So you pair those together, his evaluation, along with Steve's, and uh, you might have a, a top top-notch player there and there's another guy over there too we shouldn't forget about Nick Cronwall yeah and Cronwall is going to have a, a big influence on that too so I and I think him playing over there Lucas Raymond and and you get those extra watches and, and now a little bit more mature and playing in the Swedish league 
Um, I wonder how much that also influenced what they were doing. They did go D with their, their second pick, the 32nd pick overall with uh, with William Wallander. What can you tell us about him? Well, he was uh, projected to be in the first round. He's a big, mobile defenseman who can skate. And he has a great shot from the point. He can run a power play. Uh, you know, because of his size, people wish he, you know, he were a little more physical. But uh, here is a guy that I, I think when you think of Mo Sider, who's a right-handed shot, and you think of a Will Under, who is a left-handed shot, you know, you have two guys that are six foot four. Uh, both of them are highly skilled defensemen. One has a little more offensive upside, which was actually is Willander, as opposed to Sider, who is more of a you know all round player, I guess I would say. So I think this is a really, really good pick. He's six four and only one ninety one. Kenny, if he needs help on gaining some weight, would you be willing to sort of uh, some offer some tips? On... You, know, you know what, John? I can tell him how to eat burgers and everything. You know? <laughs> he came no the... drinking, though. <laughs> yeah, well, that, too, but he can come to the right person here. But, no, you know what? I like those big, tall defensemen. If you can move the puck now, um, you know, you're just going to be dynamic in the National Hockey League. And let's face it, the Red Wings need some offense from their defensemen. A couple years down the road, that could happen. All right, those are the impressions of those following the wings. In a moment, those of the guy who is running the wings, executive vice president and general manager. Steve Eisenman's takeaways from the drafting choices made in this crucial stretch of time for his team when we continue from the Red Wings dressing room in just a moment. Back in 1983, he had the same kind of butterflies that kids did on October 6th and 7th. Steve Eiserman was selected fourth overall for the Red Wings, and the franchise became much better. He was selecting fourth overall this draft, and 12 times in the selection process for his team now. We're happy to be joined now by the executive vice president and general manager of the Red Wings, Steve Eiserman. I'm joined by... Ken Daniels and Art Regner for the purposes of, of this segment. Steve, as, as we welcome you in, what are your takeaways from the draft? Well, consider it's the first time we've done it virtually, and uh, I, I think it went relatively well, but uh, uh, functionally it worked for everyone. So, you know, we, what, we picked 12 players, 12 prospects, and uh, obviously we have optimism for all of them, and, and you know, time will tell how they, if they pan out or not players for the Ravens. Steve, I'll, I'll get to the prospect question in just a moment, but first, how weird was it where you could be at the draft and nod to somebody, maybe go talk to somebody, and now you're looking at your phone texting? How strange was it for you? And in part, do you think that's why maybe fewer deals were made on the draft days? You know, like, it, it, there was good and bad to it. I, like, I, I like the fact that, you know, although I wasn't even in the room with our guys, like we were on a, on a, on a uh, Microsoft Teams call, and uh, we could talk freely. That was really good. Warren, as you know, on the draft floor, it's you know on as, on day one anyway. There's so many people in this. You know, usually the building's full. There's a lot of buzz. People are walking around. You don't know who's over your shoulder, and uh, it, it's just it, it, there's a lot of noise around. Just distractions. This was really good. You literally could sit uh, at your desk and concentrate. The, the, uh, so no, I don't. I don't think that was the reason. It seemed like there was a lot of trades made as far as uh, draft picks going back and forth. Maybe not so much in the first round, but day two there was a lot going on. Um, and I, honestly, I think the biggest reason that there was no like major blockbusters, or whatever you guys, uh, you know, whatever, I was simply because of the uncertainty of the cap and everybody trying to figure out uh, you know, what they need to do internally. It's getting it's 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 a complicated off season for everyone, and you know you, we like a lot, we all like this player, that player. But then you look at his contract in normal years, you'd say, you know what, I can I, I can live with that or whatnot. Now you're taking into account how much, you know, what's the cap number, what's his cash, more so than you ever would. So I think it's everyone is proceeding more cautiously, and I think that's why there's probably more, my opinion there was fewer trips yesterday. Well, Steve, you got a hang of it pretty good. I mean, you made four deals on, on day two of the draft, uh, mostly just uh, acquiring some picks. What I'm curious about is Lucas Raymond. Uh, from what I was able to gather, 
that there were several players that you were really interested in, but you kept going back to Lucas Raymond. What was it about him that made you decide to pick him fourth overall? Yeah, again, our, there was, we could have gone different directions. We like, uh, I'll say a small group of players, a handful of guys at that spot, and all that played different positions. Ultimately, and you can only pick one, as you know, we like, uh, we, we really like Lucas's, uh, his skills, his competitiveness, and his hockey sense. Those would be the three things that jump out the, uh, the most to us. And every player there had a combination of everything. And like I said, we just felt that, uh, you know, he provided the most of everything that we're looking for um, out of the group. Did seeing him in Sweden and the start that he had because he's playing, did it sway you a little? Oh, no, no, actually, Ken, we kind of, we had him there throughout the, when we, we finished our, I don't know when we finished our off-season meetings, I want to say in spring, but they were some, somewhere in the summer, we had him, we kind of, we had him in that spot at four, and again, we were comfortable, um, you know, we could have, if we met every day, we would have changed four, five, six, seven, back and forth, and you could justify it. Anyway, they're all, they're all really good prospects, but we had him there. The fact that we could watch him a little bit this spring, um, or excuse me, this fall, um, did sway us, but it just kind of reaffirmed what you know, we were thinking. The good thing was we got to see him play more, you know, and, and, and uh, uh, for one, the last year as an 18-year-old on a, a real good men's team, uh, you know, he, he had a limited role, and, and this year he's gotten, in, in the early start of their season, he's gotten to play a bigger role, so we got to see him more. It, it kind of reaffirmed the uh, our belief in him, and uh, so yeah, it really didn't change the position. Was there much interest in any teams trading up to your fourth spot before you selected fourth overall? Um, a little bit of interest. And how much did number uh, thirty-two get uh, between Tuesday evening and, and and Wednesday morning? Surprise! You know, not. Not a lot of interest. It, you know, it, it was something we would have looked at. But again, I, I think, you know, I looked at this draft. Everybody seemed to have were comfortable in the spot. They were at least, for the most part, the first, second round. Everyone, you talk to other general managers and see what they're thinking. And my feeling was early was everybody was pretty comfortable where they were. And, um, you know, we kind of weigh when you're trading these draft picks, moving up or moving back, what you have to give up or what you to to, to, to either move up or move back. Um, and, you know, you, none, of the, none of the trades really kind of made sense from a value perspective um, to, to do. So, um, obviously, we, 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 were, and we were comfortable picking at four. We didn't really look too hard. And, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't really the options that made sense for us. And then again, at 32, I think there was a while, if I recall, it was just my head's kind of spinning a bit from yesterday. But I think there was some mild interest, but nobody really, you know, some teams don't have a pick that you need to, that you'll do it for in a later round or whatnot. So they offer you maybe the best they can offer, and it's not enough for you to want to do it. Steve, when you look at this draft, the way it broke it broken down, uh, six forwards, five defensemen, one goaltender. Uh, looking at the defenseman with that 32nd pick, you took uh, William Willander, who is a big mobile defenseman, a left-handed shot. Out of the five defensemen, four were left-handed shots. One was a righty. Uh, were, was it your goal to kind of replenish the stock as far as uh, left-handed shooting defensemen, because the Red Wings seem to have an abundance of really good right-handed shooting defensemen in the system. It, it's just kind of the way our list worked out. And then at some point you look and it's like, hey, we have dropped, drafted a lot of D. Like, hey, as we're getting into these later rounds, are there other options? Can we balance this out a little bit? So we take it into account, but you, put, you say that with the caveat of guys, okay, don't pass up on a guy you really want because – drafted too many left shot D, you know, not again, you don't know which, you know, as much as we'd like to think, we don't really know out of this group, particularly as you get later in, which of them are going to develop in the NHL or so you try to take the best prospects. But I we did as it went on kind of pay attention a little bit to okay, you know, can we can we add somebody in a different role? Is somebody fit in this five, six, seventh round that that we really like because we do we have drafted a lot of D men and Eventually, you got to take into account what you 
can assign these guys where they're going to play. You know, you can only have so many guys. That's where the goaltending is tricky because you end up only having five spots for goaltenders to play really once they've signed contracts. There's two in the NHL, two in the American League, and you usually have a fifth one in the playing in these coast leagues so you run out of spots for your goalies so you kind of got to be careful about uh if you draft them eventually you hope to sign them and once you sign them you've got to have spots to play there more with steve in a moment we'll talk about the kids who are a little bit more grown up those who have cracked the roster and perhaps those who are about to as our red wings post draft show continues from the red wings dressing room here on fox sports Football. Welcome back. We continue, and for this segment, joined by the radio voice of the Red Wings, Ken Cal, and Trevor Thompson of Fox Sports Detroit. And Steve, because of COVID, some of your players have been loaned to European teams to get some games in. How much will they be helped by this process? Well, I, I think it's really important, uh, really, for every player to play. But you know, these young kids uh, like aren't the Red Wings GR uh, really the junior leagues probably also at the same time. It was early March when play was suspended, and uh, a lot of guys had a lot of guys haven't played. The younger players, we want to get them going. We're not sure when the American League is going to exactly start. It'll start later than the National Hockey League, so we we in a lot of cases tried to be proactive and get our guys playing. And a lot of the European the kids that are over in Europe, whether they were in Sweden or you know in most Siders' case in Germany, they were able to either practice and train with their their, their Former clubs, uh, some of them are actually playing. The German league is suspended uh, or still hasn't uh, returned to play. Therefore, we're going to, you know, loan uh, um, over the Swedish league. So, you know, we're trying to trying to develop these guys. They all, the guys, a lot of guys want to play. We haven't been able to find spots for some, uh, but the European guys we have, and uh, again, we want to get them playing. And uh, with so much uncertainty over here, these European leagues playing. Uh, we get a chance to play them in good leagues. They're, they've been training and practicing for so long. They're anxious to play games. So I think it's really important to get them going. Sure. Steve, out of the 12 players that you drafted um, you know, in the draft, are there any surprises in the later rounds that you would look at and say, wow, this could be a really good pick? Ken, the answer to that is you know, two, three, four, five years from now, honestly. You know, we really don't know. Our scouts feel good now. We're – you get our area scouts, uh, and that's their kind of their opportunity to really kind of take charge, and they get excited and they take great pride in you know finding a good prospect at that spot. You know? So um, we leave it to them, and they all feel good. And it's interesting you're sitting there listening to them push for why they want this player and what makes them think that he's a prospect that has a chance to play. So we have optimism for all of them today. Um, but really, what you know, I'm anxious. To, some of them I have to see them play some of these kids. You know, I, um, I, whenever we have our next development camp or whenever they start playing, and what I'll do once we get free agency on the way is get online and be able to pull up some previous games to watch them a little bit and have a have a little bit better feel for them. But um, again, you know, kind of the answer. You know, we look at you know, I use in, in my situation in Tampa where we drafted Andre Collide in the seventh round and. Uh, I had, I had not seen him play. He was playing in the Quebec League. He was a 19-year-old, picked him late in the seventh round, and he came to our summer camp, and we watched him. And we're like, hey, you know, it looks pretty good. If he could, he was coming off an injury, which I didn't really miss. It wasn't a major one, but, you know, if he can get a little quicker, he looks like he has a chance. And we were thinking about sending him back to junior, actually. As an overage, we weren't sure we wanted to sign him. Comes into our training camp in the American Hockey League, and, uh, everyone thought, you know what, he should be able to go in the American League. Let's leave him there. I think we signed him at that point, and he played really well in the American League. And it was at that point then when we thought, you know, geez, I think we got a player here. And sure enough, two years later, he was on the team. So to answer your question again right now, we're optimistic about them all, but until we truly, truly see these guys on the ice and what they look like, and and it almost it goes for every round. We, you draft all these kids, and then you get to see them on the ice, particularly in September or the start of training camp, and then you get a better feel for how close is this guy or is he a legit prospect or is he not, or see how far away he is. Steve, I wanted to ask you about your blue line too. Uh, you've moved on from some guys, could be some opportunities for some of your younger guys. 
Gustav Lindstrom showed himself uh, nicely at the end of last season. And then Dennis Cholosky a bit up and down. Those two guys in particular, openings for them, or how do you see those guys fitting in moving forward this season? Well, again, you know, I think it's, you know, it's been a tough, for Dennis, it's been a tough two years, again, being up and down, up and down. And a lot of it has been, we've had injuries. I know two years ago, uh, the Red Wings, their blue line was devastated right off the bat. I think the plan was for Dennis to stay uh, in GR and play. He was, you know, he was with the team early and then just send him down. They're the best thing could, could have been for the last two years. But unfortunately, again, last year, injuries altered that a little bit. So it's hard for the guys to go up and down. My own preference generally is to put them in the minors and leave them there and, and until they kind of played their way out of it, you know, played their way out of the minors. Um, but having said that, uh, you know, um, Dennis at times did very well, showed a lot of good things. I just think he needs to play a lot. In American ways, he needs to play, play in a lot of different situations to, to you know, improve his all-around game as a team. Gustav last year, again, the plan was to leave him in the minors and let him play. He did very well, was doing very well in the American League. Really injuries dictated bringing him up and he really kind of exceeded our expectations on the blue line. And again, through injury and then, and his play, he played a lot more than we expected and he did well. Am I prepared to say either of them, whenever we start up, uh, are on the team? No, I wouldn't say that, but I think ideally I'd like our young guys, whenever we start up in the minors, I'd like them, I'd like them playing and playing a lot together. I think they can benefit from that. And if they're too good for the American League, certainly we can bring them up at want to ask you about a couple of forwards who've been around for a while now too. Uh, Evgeny Shvechenkov, a former first round pick, a big body and another big body in Giovanni Smith. How you see those guys fitting in moving forward and competing for some spots here and uh, how Shvech is doing as far as that knee goes now and where he might be in his uh, uh, rehab. Yeah, well, you know, I think it's fine. Uh, uh, it takes a while, while you know, he, he missed the entire season I think the previous year virtually the entire season. Came back and had some injuries, unfortunately, missed some games last year as well. But we were pleased, we're happy to re-sign him. Um, yeah, great guy, big, strong. Bench. He's got to get healthy and play a lot of games. He'll have a chance uh, to play. I don't think he needs waivers for another year. I'm not sure, um, uh, but he'll have a chance to play for us. Giovanni again played games. Our intention was to leave him in the minors all year last year. He had a very good year, and ultimately. When you're looking to call up, you like, you know what, he really deserves a chance. And he, and he came up and he did really well. And uh, we think he's got he's going to have a future in, in Detroit. Is it at the start of this year? I get my feeling is I'd rather have one or any of these guys playing a lot of minutes in the American League versus you know, getting into the fourth line and you know, you're know you playing those seven or eight minutes. If you don't get the special teams, limit your ice time. They're better off. Being in the American, and we have that luxury for in Giovanni's case one more season before he would be waivers. But certainly, on last, we really think he's trending in the right direction. We think he's going to be a player on our team, and and have a positive impact. Hey, Steve, uh, thanks for your time. Uh, get a good deep breath in, if you would. Take a day off, and uh, <laughs> here's hoping these kids arrive in Detroit exactly when they're ready. I wasn't finished with my answer. You cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Sorry to have cut you off. Uh, <laughs> the uh, the audio is a little tricky here, um, but uh, but thanks for doing this. We appreciate it. So who else found some magic in what was considered a very deep NHL draft? Which teams are suddenly better? We'll bring the panel back together and share some thoughts on that next as we continue here on Fox Sports Detroit in a scope. You may have missed this, but the NHL and the NHL Players Association put out a memo that states they have every intention of starting this season on January 1st with the hope that there will be fans in the buildings. We can't wait until then. So, Trev, you touched upon this with uh, with Stevie just a few moments ago. There, there are spots for him to fill. Certainly there's going to be some opportunities uh, along the blue line. We talked about Gustav Lindstrom. Loved his play last year. Would love to see what he can do. Dennis Chalosky's been up and down. Is he ready to take the next step and make it a, a big step forward and not three steps back? I think the Red Wings filled a lot of needs and have a lot of intriguing prospects led by, I think, 
the goaltender and, uh, is, is is Bednash. I think Jan Bednash could really be a really good goaltender. He's either going to be great or he's going to be bad. I mean, there's no two ways about <laughs> well, it. I, we can, no, we well, can say that about all of us, yeah, really. Yeah, yeah, but, I mean. but seriously, <laughs> Bednash, when he's on, it, he's one of the best goalies in the world. But, uh, but, but I would say New York, obviously, for getting the number one pick. Ottawa, I thought, did really well. But the Red Wings did pretty good, too. You didn't like didn't Ottawa's. Like it. You didn't like didn't Ottawa's. Didn't like it. Uh, I thought they were highly more higher-rated players. Everybody had Cole Perfetti on some mock drafts attached to the Red Wings at four. And uh, Marco Rossi was attached to the Red Wings at four. Those guys continue to slip. And in Minnesota and in Winnipeg, they're giddy today about getting those two guys. And I think that uh, Ottawa in those, that spot at five missed an opportunity to grab a gem. And I also thought, even when we did our pre-draft show, that they might make a big surprise at the top of the draft at three and then take uh, Jamie Drysdale, uh, the best D in the draft, who I did think was the best D in the draft ahead of Sanderson. So didn't like what they did at five. One of the things we're talking about goaltenders here, we talked about uh, bed notch there with Detroit, but one of the, the surprises I thought, I, I'm surprised that the Toronto Maple Leafs didn't try to trade up. Maybe they did. We just don't know about it, but they could use a goaltender and all this talk about Escara that we've been talking about in the previous shows, you know, he was the best goaltender in the draft. Why didn't the Toronto Maple Leafs move up? Maybe they did. I don't know. But that was a surprise to me. I'm with you. I like what Ottawa did. Stutz is supreme, whether it be center, he winds up in the wing and they got a big defenseman who can move the puck, who's more physical than Drysdale in getting Jake Sanderson. You get a forward, you get a D. I think that's pretty good. Bottom line is, who did well, John? All 31 teams yeah, did great. Right. We'll let you know in four <laughs> years. A lot of patience is required, and, and we're told that Raymond, the, the Wings' top pick, is going to spend the entirety of, of the season in Sweden. These guys are stashed for a while, and you have to let them grow. Well, they're, they're 18 years old. Some are 19. It takes time, and very few can come in and, and just play. Lafreniere, maybe. Rossi, a little older. Maybe he can come right in and play. Uh, they're thinking Stutzla can. Can Byfield? I'm not so sure. Just look at Jack Hughes, where he used to dominate, and he came into the National Hockey League, yeah. and where he had time before, no time now. Defensemen can close the gap in the National Hockey League, and forwards can too like that. All of a sudden, you're going, wow, where did that come from? And your head's spinning. You're 18 years old. Give everybody time. Well, the one good thing about Lucas Raymond, when we talked to him on draft night, he was really realistic. I, I was really impressed with it. He said, look, I, I know I'm going to be in Sweden. I'm on Frulunda right now. And I, you know, and he, start, he started off really, really well. And he's on the power play. He's doing everything that he needs to do. You know, he's a little small on the small side. But, you know, he's putting on weight. And, you know, I like that. When a player has that much confidence, and most of the elites do, when he says, yeah, my timeline is I'm going to be a Red Wing next season, uh, I say more power to him. I like hearing that. What I really like about what I'm seeing right now with this Red Wing team is the fact that in two or three years, the core group of this team is going to be really young. And if if all these guys can pan out, plus you have veterans now like uh, Larkin and Bertuzzi and Mantha, <laughs> all of a sudden you've got some pretty good players in the mix and they're all going to grow up and be Red Wings together for a long period of time. All right, they had the most choices to make in the National Hockey League draft, and the hope is that more than a handful of those kids will find their way eventually to where we sit right now, here in the Red Wings dressing room. And as we mentioned to Steve Eisenman, the hope is that that's exactly when they're ready. The 2020 draft has come and gone. For Ken Daniels and Art Regner and Ken Cal and Trevor Thompson, I'm John Keating. We thank you for watching.